Throughout history, the question of whether theology can exist and how it can be developed has persisted. This inquiry depends on the era under consideration. In the modern period, from the 18th to the late 20th centuries, there was a strong belief in human rationality and the rationality of the universe. Events were explained in terms of social realities rather than the purpose of a transcendent God, and causation was thought of as efficient rather than final. Modernism, founded by René Descartes, emphasized rationality and certainty. Descartes sought to base thinking on indubitable principles, like mathematics, from which reasoning could then proceed. The philosopher Immanuel Kant also heavily influenced modern views, concluding that two elements were necessary for theoretical knowledge, sense experience and rational structure of the mind. Kant believed we have no sensory experience of God and therefore cannot know God through theoretical reason. John Herman Randall's Making of the Modern Mind provided several characteristics of modernity, including humanism, naturalism, reductionism, determinism, and foundationalism. The rise of modern science accentuated empirical observation and testing, with technology playing a key role in justifying the scientific method. Theology faced a battle for its respectability in a world that exalted science and reduced knowledge to the scientific. When theology and Christian evidences were adduced, they often sought to establish the existence of God by natural reason and certify the accuracy of the scriptures. Some theologians, like Carl Henry, challenged the modern conception of knowledge and sought to show that even science had its unproven assumptions. Also, postmodernism has emerged as a movement that challenges the modernistic view of objective truths and systematic descriptions. It encompasses several themes, including 1. The conditioned nature of knowledge. Postmodernists assert that all knowledge is conditioned and relative to the knower, depending on their geographical and cultural context. 2. The locus of meaning. Postmodernism affirms interpretation, as meaning arises from the interaction between the author's intention and the reader's understanding. 3. Skepticism towards all inclusive theories. Postmodernists reject grand narratives, like the theory of everything believing that knowledge is perspectival and there can be no universal truth. 4. Distrust of the efficacy of reason as the sole source of knowledge. Postmodernists value intuition, imagination, and the role of power in shaping truth. 5. Diminution of the value of propositions. Postmodernism prefers narrative approaches and personal experiences as ways to convey truth. 6. Rejection of foundationalism. Postmodernists oppose the idea that knowledge must be based on unquestionable propositions, opting instead for coherentism or pragmatism. 7. Lessened optimism about the benefits of knowledge. Postmodernists recognize that knowledge is not always inherently good or capable of solving all human problems. While postmodernism offers valid critiques of modernism, it faces weaknesses and inconsistencies as well. Its concepts of deconstruction and perspectivalism may lead to nihilism and universal skepticism. Furthermore, postmodernists often do not adhere to their theory and practice, still arguing for their positions as if they possess objective truth. Moreover, the nature and purpose of doctrine have been debated over the years with several different views emerging. The following are the five predominant views. 1. Doctrine as a conveyor of truth. Historically, the dominant view. This perspective sees doctrines as statements capable of being true or false, primarily describing the nature of God, his intentions, and his relationships with his creation. 2. Doctrine as interpretation of experience. According to this view, doctrine is an expression of religious feelings, which arise when reflecting on experiences of dependency on God. Theologian Stanley Grenz regards theology as the community's reflection on its faith, rather than an individual's reflection on personal experience. 3. Doctrine as practical action. Albrecht Ritschel and others assert the importance of practical activity and value judgments in understanding doctrine, which has led to various liberation theologies prioritizing the experiences of oppressed communities. 4. Doctrine as linguistic rules. George Lindbeck and other post-liberal theologians contend that doctrines function as the operating rules of Christian communities, similar to the rules of grammar. 5. Doctrine as the story of God's working. This perspective posits that doctrine should be viewed as a narrative of God's activity, including the ongoing work of Christ in the church, rather than a collection of propositions. 
Each of these views has merit and can contribute to a comprehensive understanding of doctrine. It is clear that biblical writers believed their statements about God and salvation were describing objective reality, and their teachings were often rooted in profound experiences of God. Furthermore, doctrines carry practical implications and impact how religious communities function. In addition, Perspectivism and Ideology is an essay that discusses how all thought is influenced by a specific point in history and culture and how this often goes unrecognized by individuals. It debates that there is no absolute and unlimited perspective, no neutral standing point from which one can view reality as it is, pure and uncontaminated by some particularity. Perspectivists, those who subscribe to the belief that individual perspectives shape reality, often only apply this insight to criticize their opponents' positions, neglecting to apply it to their own views. This can lead to chronocentism, the idea that one's present time is not only superior to preceding periods, but also to any that might follow. This exclusive attitude can lead to criticism of differing views, based on the belief that they are influenced by a faulty philosophy or worldview. Another reason for this ideological blind spot is that a person may be so unable to escape their own perspective that they are incapable of recognizing it as a perspective. In this case, their own conditioning may be so complete that it shields them from the realization that they are not working from a neutral viewpoint. In some cases, particularly among postmodernists who follow the approach of Michel Foucault, individuals may hold the view that power makes truth, leading them to assert their views as long as they go unchallenged. This phenomenon is not unique to theologians and philosophers. The sociology of knowledge contends that beliefs and ideas grow out of the social setting in which they are held, and in more extreme forms of this sociology, they are thought of as having been determined by that social setting. This raises the question of whether the sociology of knowledge can also be applied to the theory known as the sociology of knowledge itself, potentially relativizing it as well as other theories. However, the idea of doctrine being primarily cognitive offers several advantages. Doctrines express the experiences of believers, but these experiences would not occur without the doctrinal framework to contextualize them. Also, doctrines have practical implications, but the practice often follows from doctrine rather than vice versa. Doctrines serve as community guidelines, but an objective grounding in reality is needed to avoid relativism. Ultimately, the cognitive approach, which encompasses other insights, has been the dominant view historically for a good reason. Further, Erickson confers that we must go beyond the positions of postmodernism, advocating for a post-postmodernism that chronologically preceded the advent of postmodernism. He contends that if postmodernism considers that all beliefs are historically and culturally conditioned, yet does not apply this insight to its own position without offering any exceptions or exempting conditions, then we should push further. The view that Erickson advocates posits that all views are conditioned and biased, but this should not be the conclusion of the matter. Rather, it should be considered as a transitional point. From this standpoint, Erickson asserts that we must actively attempt to reduce the effect of conditioning on our own outlook. Perfect objectivity may not be attainable, but it is desirable, and a close approximation should be pursued. This leads to the question of what the character of a theology built on this conception should be in the current environment. Erickson identifies several characteristics that are particularly prominent for this period, but are also applicable to doing theology at other times. The main thrust of his argument is that a post-postmodernist theology should strive for a more balanced and objective perspective on matters of faith and doctrine. Instead of adhering strictly to either traditional or contemporary viewpoints, one should be open to evaluating and re-evaluating one's beliefs in light of new insights and discoveries. Besides, in theology, it is important to recognize that all our knowledge is limited and influenced by the unique circumstances and experiences of individuals or groups. This concept is called post-perspectivism, which takes the reality of perspectivism seriously and attempts to go beyond it. To move past this limited understanding, one can engage in a few activities that may help make sense of differing perspectives, although it is impossible to completely eliminate subjectivity. First, Writing an intellectual autobiography can help identify factors that affect one's perception of things, as well as their possible biases. This self-examination process should be as detailed as possible 
and be submitted to others who can offer additional insights. Second, interacting with different perspectives can aid in understanding alternative viewpoints and their validity. Ideally, the dialogue partner should come from a different culture or time to minimize ethnocentrism or chronocentrism. Engaging in these conversations requires suspending judgments and convictions and focusing on understanding why the differing viewpoint is persuasive to its proponents. Another helpful approach is playing the devil's advocate with oneself by critiquing one's position and looking at the strongest arguments against it. This process is recommended by economist Milton Friedman, who suggests that one cannot be sure of their beliefs unless they know the arguments against it better than their opponents. Achieving a higher degree of objectivity is not easy, nor quick, and may remain an ongoing process. However, it is essential to remind oneself of their limitations and hold their convictions with humility, allowing for self-correction and growth over time. The alternative of maintaining a fixed or dogmatic position can lead to prejudice and stagnation. By embracing post-perspectivism, theologians can better appreciate different viewpoints and move beyond the limits of their own perspectives. Additionally, the nature of truth has been debated extensively, with different viewpoints, such as correspondence, coherence and pragmatism, offering different definitions. The correspondence view claims that propositions are true if they accurately describe reality, while the coherence view states that propositions are true if they cohere with other propositions. Pragmatism, on the other hand, maintains that propositions are true if they work in practice. These views can be seen as tests or measures of truth, rather than the absolute nature of truth. In everyday life, a correspondence view is often used, but coherence and pragmatism also have their merits as tests of truth. Coherence is a necessary but insufficient test of truth, as incoherence may indicate falsity, but coherence is not always indicative of truth. A work of fiction may be coherent, but it remains a work of fiction. Pragmatism can also have its drawbacks as a test of truth, as short-term success may not necessarily equate to long-term agreement with reality. As the debate on the nature of truth continues, it is important to recognize that a combination of different viewpoints and tests may be necessary to assess the truth of a proposition. While coherence and pragmatism may be useful tools, a more comprehensive approach to truth is needed to ensure accurate understanding and application of truth in various situations. Also, neo-foundationalism is a response to criticisms of classical foundationalism, which has lost popularity in recent years. Classical foundationalism holds that there are basic propositions that are indubitable or incorrigible, and that other propositions are justified by their relationship to these foundational beliefs. These beliefs form the foundation and superstructure of knowledge. However, Modern philosophers have largely rejected foundationalism in favor of postmodernism, which highlights the conditioned nature of knowledge and skepticism about objectivity. Critics deliberate that classical foundationalism faces the epistemic regress problem, which involves the need to justify the justifiers of our beliefs. They also claim that foundationalism does not fulfill its own criteria for rational beliefs. These criticisms, however, only apply to classical foundationalism and its insistence on absolute certainty. Neo-foundationalism, on the other hand, focuses on the idea that there are starting points for reasoning that do not require indubitability or incorrigibility. Neo-foundationalism acknowledges that knowledge has a hierarchical structure, with basic propositions serving as starting points for other propositions that follow from them. This view allows for a variety of foundational propositions, such as sensory perceptions or theological beliefs. Unlike classical foundationalism, neo-foundationalism does not necessarily exclude the use of coherence, as it recognizes that there can be compatibility between different types of foundationalism and coherentism. Moreover, theology and traditional philosophies often face criticism for relying on conventional logic, while postmodernists and their followers debate for an alternative logic. However, this alternative logic is rarely given any real content, making it difficult to evaluate. The problem with rejecting a traditional logic of opposition is that it requires assuming the very thing being refuted. An objective logic is essential to individual and societal functioning, and can be trusted and employed in theology. Classical objectivism should not be dismissed as unrepentant modernism. 
It is a belief in the possibility and desirability of knowledge and understanding reality and the endeavour to approximate it ever more closely. Imagination and creativity are essential in formulating models and hypotheses, but in our time, these qualities have declined due to cultural changes like television and the internet providing preformed opinions. Critical thinking and sanctified imagination are necessary for conceiving spiritual and theological truths and models of doctrines, but they must ultimately be tested by other methods as well. Last but not least, Erickson discusses the three-tiered model to help understand the different aspects of faith, doctrine and theology in Christianity. The model unfolds as follows. On the first level are the practicing Christians who have faith in God through Jesus Christ and are engaged in living the Christian life. Their beliefs about the nature of God and his relationship to the world are embedded in their experience and activity. These believers may not be able to consciously articulate their beliefs, but their doctrines are implicit within their relationship to Christ. On the second level is conscious reflection on doctrine, which may be termed theology. This is engaged in by those who teach other believers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, etc. Theology involves a more sophisticated version of Christian faith, aiming to understand the meaning of Christian faith and life more fully. It attempts to think through doctrinal beliefs more precisely, interrelate them intentionally, and examine them in light of their sources. The third level consists of theoreticians of theology, who think through the meaning and possibilities of theology seeking to refine it and relate it to new developments, cultural and otherwise. These people also need to be practicing believers with some experience in mentoring others. Erickson contends that theology is a necessity for the church to function well and is a possibility for its continued growth and development. However, it is important for theorists and practitioners to balance rigorous reflection with practical experience in order to maintain the integrity of faith, doctrine, and theology. In conclusion, throughout history, the question of whether theology can exist and its development has persisted, heavily influenced by factors such as human rationality, the rationality of the universe, social realities, scientific advancements, and cultural contexts. The modern era, particularly the 18th to the late 20th centuries, was characterized by a strong belief in human rationality and the rise of modern science. This period saw theology struggle to maintain its respectability, often seeking to establish the existence of God through natural reason and verify the accuracy of the scriptures. The emergence of postmodernism challenged objective truths and systematic descriptions, focusing on the conditioned nature of knowledge, interpretation, skepticism toward all-inclusive theories, distrust of reason, preference for narrative approaches, rejection of foundationalism, and lessened optimism about the benefits of knowledge. Moreover, various views on the nature and purpose of doctrine have emerged, including doctrine as a conveyor of truth, as interpretation of experience, as practical action, as linguistic rules, and as the story of God's work. Each view has merit and contributes to a comprehensive understanding of doctrine. Erickson argues for a post-postmodernism approach, one that acknowledges the conditioned and biased nature of all perspectives, but actively seeks to reduce the impact of these factors. Key activities to achieve a more balanced and objective perspective include writing an intellectual autobiography, interacting with different points of view, and playing the devil's advocate with oneself. Additionally, understanding the nature of truth requires a combination of different definitions and tests, such as correspondence, coherence, and pragmatism. Neo-foundationalism offers a response to criticisms of classical foundationalism, focusing on starting points for reasoning that do not require absolute certainty. A hierarchical structure of knowledge is acknowledged, with a compatibility between neo-foundationalism and coherentism. It is important to maintain classical objectivism, which indicates the possibility and desirability of knowledge and understanding reality. Finally, Erickson presents a three-tiered model to understand faith, doctrine and theology, with practicing Christians at the first level conscious reflection on doctrine at the second level, and theoreticians of theology at the third level. The challenge lies in balancing rigorous reflection with practical experience to ensure the integrity of faith, doctrine, and theology.